Hi, good morning, and welcome to church. We're so glad that you can join us. Please join us as we fellowship and worship the King of Kings. Amen.
the Lord. What a great and awesome day the Lord has given unto us. We rejoice and we are glad. We thank God for the wonderful time of praise and worship we have had with our worship team led by Minister Emmanuel Buabasa. We give glory to God for their lives and the team. Amen. Um, last week, I began the subject on the fruit of the Spirit love, the fruit of the Spirit. And the first thing we're looking at is love, because many consider this month of February a month of love, and particularly today, which is the 14th of February, considered Valentine's Day. Now, many people really do not know the origin, the essence, and the spiritual importance of Valentine's Day. Spiritual importance, I'm sure some of you are wondering, because that which is celebrated for many people has no spiritual significance. And let me just give you a little background history to Valentine's Day. During the third century, a very oppressive Roman emperor called Emperor Claudius II had made it a capital punishment to worship and to serve Christ. He had decreed that the Romans will serve and worship his gods and deprive the Roman soldiers, the very young ones, from getting married. But there was an elderly Christian who stood his ground for his faith and insisted on serving Jesus Christ and preaching the love of God to the young soldiers, despite the decree made by this Roman emperor. And so it was considered treason against the government. He was arrested and sentenced to death. And so he was jailed. In the last few weeks of his life in prison, the jailer, who was the prison commander, observed how he learned and possessed very good Christian character and sought to teach the young soldiers around there about Christ. So he brought his blind daughter to be given lessons by this elderly Christian. This Christian taught the young girl about God, told her about the many stories in the Bible, taught her about the love of God, and the blind girl got so used to this elderly Christian prisoner. And on the last night before he would be executed, he wrote a note to this young girl called Julia and signed the note from your Valentine. His death sentence was to be carried out the next day, which was uh, February the 14th, 270 AD. The name of this martyr for Christ was Valentinus, Valentinus, from which we get Valentine. Later on, the Catholic Church granted him sainthood because of his demonstration of the love of God. So you see that this day was actually setting a set aside to celebrate a martyr, somebody who died preaching the love of God and Christ. I don't think that that is near anything that is done today on Valentine's Day. So this is just a little background history to it. Last week, I started off from Galatians chapter number 5, verse 22 and 23. The Bible says uh, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Hallelujah. The fruit of the Spirit. Now, there's been a little uh, discussion, as I said last week, about whether it was talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit or the fruit of the human spirit. But when you read uh, the whole text, he's talking about mainly the human spirit, you know, and he also talks about the regenerated human spirit, the human spirit that is born again, exhibits a certain character. So beloved, when we talk about the fruit of the spirit, we're talking about the character of the believer, that which must be manifested in our lives when we do give our lives to Christ. Our lives must reflect the character of Christ because the life of God actually lives in us. So he says the fruit, remember, it's just a singular word, fruit, just like you have an orange that has many sectors by its one fruit. So the fruit of the human spirit recreated, remember the word is recreated, regenerated human spirit. This is the, the fruit, the character that must come from it. And it, the first thing is love, love. And last week I also led us to read John chapter number 15 understanding how this fruit comes about. We know that the Bible tells us that when we get born again, Christ's spirit comes to indwell us. Christ, the person, is in heaven, but his spirit is what comes to indwell us. Therefore, Paul could say in Galatians 2.10, 20, sorry, Galatians 2, 20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. So it's the spirit of Christ that comes to live in us. And the fruit of that infusion of our spirit and the spirit of Christ is what is described in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So John 15 Verse number one to three or four. Paul said, sorry, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the husband man or my father is the farmer, the one who is in charge. Every branch in me that bears fruit, that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So we have fruit, more fruit, much fruit, more fruit, a process, a process. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he purges or he takes away. But every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abides in the vine. No more can ye, except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So you see here, fruit, more fruit, much fruit. God's aim is not for us to remain just the way we are when we receive Christ. We are being transformed. We are being changed into the very image of Christ. We grow into the nature of Christ. And so Christ compares our life to 
a vine. And he tells us that he is the vine. We are the branches. Fruit is found on the branches. Now, fruit comes about due to the life. As the, the branches abide in the vine, the life of the vine flows and cause, causes fruitfulness. Causes fruitfulness. But the father is the one in charge of the vine. And the Bible says, when there is a branch that is not fruitful, he takes it away. But if the branch is fruitful, then he prunes it, he cuts it. Like, you know, when we talk about pruning, typically we think about roses, rose bushes. You know, when you don't prune a rose bush, it just grows up tall. But when you prune it, then it becomes a bush. And that's what God wants, not just for us to be shooting up, but that our lives will spread out. We take root downwards, we spread out. Hallelujah. And so he speaks about the character fruit of love. And we learn from the scriptures that God is love. I want to go to 1 John chapter number 4. This is one chapter where John describes for us the love of God. From verse number seven, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. There is no way you can be in Christ and love is not exhibited in your life. If it is not, it means you are not growing. You are not manifesting the character of Christ. And it's important that we exhibit the character of Christ. Today, as we celebrate the 14th of February, celebrating Valentine, let's go back to the origins, the origins of this celebration. It was about an elderly, godly Christian who stood his ground despite the oppressive Emperor Claudius II, who demanded that the Roman gods are the ones they are to serve. And he declared that the young soldiers will not marry. And this man stood his ground. That means he was willing to die for his faith. And beloved, that's where we are coming to in these end times. Persecution is coming, dearly beloved. Hatred for the believer is on the rise. There are a lot of countries we have not really experienced persecution, but go to countries like Russia and China and North Korea and in the Middle East and in Northern Nigeria and in different parts in Sudan where Christians have experienced persecution and some have lost their lives. But beloved, it's going to become a global phenomenon because of where the world is headed. There is an agenda that the world is following. And that agenda is to create a one world government, a one world religion. And it will call for the persecution of Christians because we, if we are going to really live by the word of God, will be hated because it goes again against the world's morality. Today's morality, evil is called good and good is called evil. We are coming to a place where we will not have the liberty to speak our faith easily. That's what happened to this elderly Christian. Despite the law that had been passed, he stood his ground and he was condemned for committing treason, imprisoned, and he was to die. And the day he died was the 14th of February. Beloved, he died for the faith. I believe when we talk about Valentine, we need to really speak about the fact that we should be ready to die for our faith. So he says, 
Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is the very embodiment of love. The, the, the English translation doesn't do much good to the word love. Because in the Greek, there are many different types of love. Now, when it says God is love, that is agape, the God kind of love. The God kind of love is unconditional. Unconditional. Whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what you call love. Love, unconditional love. That's agape. That can only come from God. And that can only come when you are truly born again because it is the very essence of God. And I say that Christ comes in his spirit to dwell within the believer. And so we exhibit the character of love. He says, in this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him, hearing his love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. God is our example. He loved us when we were in rebellion against him. Loved us when we were still walking in sin. He found us. Many times we say, I found the Lord. You didn't find the Lord. It's the Lord who found you. Hallelujah. And he found you in his mercies and his grace. Amen. And so that speaks of it. I'm going to jump to verse number 16. We have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Beloved, this is the proof. The proof that you are truly born again is when you exhibit agape the unconditional love of God. It's not in the robes you wear. It's not in the songs you are singing. It is the demonstration of love. Not love towards those who love you. For Jesus in the Gospels, and we've been talking about the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus in the Gospels will tell us to love our enemies, to pray for those who despitefully use us. Beloved, that is only possible by the grace of God in a natural human sense. Beloved, you don't want to love the unlovable. You don't want to love your enemies. But it takes only the grace of God, the love that is put within us to love those who are unlovable. So he says, we know we dwell in love when we love one another. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. Fear, the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Beloved, when you see what's going on with the pandemic, how scary it is, you can easily be gripped by fear. But the Bible says, God who is love and dwells within us, when the love of God is within us, it casts away fear. You don't need to be afraid. God has not given us the spirit of fear, Paul told Timothy. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. The spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. Beloved, fear is a spirit. 
365 times is written in the Bible, fear not. Fear is not of God. You don't need to be afraid. If you are a true child of God, as Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. When you truly are a child of God and have understood what Christ has done for you, you don't fear death. Because you know, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. You are only afraid when you are not sure what happens when you die. Beloved, there's life after death. This life is just short. The one that takes place after death is forever, is eternal. And so you must make sure you are on the right side. You have surrendered your life to Christ. So his life is in you. For he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Do you have life? Are you afraid? Are you scared of dying? You can come to a place where the peace of God rules in your heart and in your mind. Hallelujah. Let me finish this up. It says fear creates torment. When you are afraid, you are tormented. That's how you become stressed. That's how, how you take on a lot of sicknesses and diseases. He says, he who fears is not made perfect in love. Beloved, beloved you have to be growing in love. Your, the love of God in you must be perfected. And the more that love grows in you, fear departs from your life. Hallelujah. And so... This is the word of God. I would encourage you to read 1 John chapter number 4 and have the understanding that love is the very nature of God. Love is the very nature of God. We, as children of God, are becoming like Jesus in nature, in word, and in deed. The character of God is love. Hallelujah. And the fruit of the Spirit, as is described, falls into three categories. Inward blessings. The first three. Love, joy, peace. Love, joy, peace come from within Love being, means being lovely within. Joy, being joyful within. Beloved, there could be storms all around you, and yet you have joy inside of you because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Peace. Somebody drew an art piece, and the art piece was a stormy sea, and on the stormy sea was a single boat, and the boat had one person. The boat was calmly floating, and the sea was rough, boisterous all around. That is what is peace. It's not the absolute absence of problems, but it is that calm, in the midst of the storm. And Jesus promised us, he says, in this world, there will be tribulation. In this world, there will be problems. But he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. My peace I give to you. Peace such as the world can never give to you. Beloved, conferences have sat the UN has put nations together, all in the, the bid to find peace. My beloved, peace is a man. Peace is Jesus. He is called the Prince of Peace. The Bible says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. 
and of the increase and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Beloved, true peace can only be found in our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives you peace in the midst of the storm. Beloved, in the midst of this pandemic, there's a peace that you can know in Christ. I'm not asking whether you attend a church, whether your name is on a church roll, whether you've been confirmed, whether you've received first communion. I'm not asking you any of that. Because Christianity, as I've been saying over time, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. It's a relationship with God. The first man, Adam, in the garden, God would come and fellowship with him. Beloved, there was no church. It was fellowship. It was a relationship. That's all God desires. Jesus said in John 17 and verse 3, and this is life eternal, that they may know the only true God. Beloved, if there's a true God, then there are false gods. And the question is, are you following the real Jesus or you are following the Jesus of this world? There are many people who have designed their own God. You find them, you look at their lives and you look at, you know, the very things they stand for. And yet they say they are Christians and, and, and they believe in Jesus Christ, but they believe in all other religions. You must not be reading the word of God. The real Jesus, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He didn't say a way amongst many ways. He didn't say a truth amongst many truths. He didn't say a life amongst many lives. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You either accept his words or you don't. Don't tell me you are a Christian when you do not accept his words. As true. The question you must ask yourself, are you following a Jesus you have fabricated for yourself? Some live their lives anyhow and they say God knows. Beloved, do not be deceived by the liar, the father of lies. For Jesus warns us that one of the main manifestations in the beginning of the end will be deception. He says, take heed that no man deceives you. Beloved, no man means no man. I don't care what robes they wear. I don't care what titles they have. I don't care what positions they hold. Your plumb line, your guideline is the word of God. Take the word of God seriously. Let that be your measuring stick. Not what people are saying and what how people are displaying. Take what God says. He says, I've sanctified you by my word, John 17, for the word is truth. I am the way. I am the truth. It's only when you find the way that you encounter the truth. And it's only when you encounter the truth that you can live the life. You cannot turn this anyhow. The life only comes to those who have truly discovered the way, who is Christ. The way is a person. The truth is a person. The life is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so the fruit of the Spirit brings us inward blessings, love, joy, peace. Brings us outward blessings, which is manifested on the outside. Patience. Patience. Being patient with others. Kindness. Being kind to others. Goodness. Being good to others. And then, the third batch is upward. Faithfulness. Being faithful to God. Meekness. Being humble before God. Self-controlled, 
bringing yourself under control, under the mighty hand of God. The Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Many of us quote this scripture and all you say is, oh, resist the devil and you flee. The beginning of that scripture says, submit yourselves to God. Then resist the devil and he will flee. The devil is going nowhere as long as you are not submitted to God. Because it's in the submitted spirit of Christ, when he humbled himself till death on the cross, God highly exalted him and gave him a name. And so let this mind be in you that was in Christ. Humble yourself. Humility. Humility. Hallelujah. And so we see that the fruit of the Spirit is what God is seeking to demonstrate and exhibit in the life of the believer. Hallelujah. And it comes about not from your own efforts. It is from the life of God that is within you. And so the Gospels teach us about being. We have the be attitudes. Being is not feeling, is being. Be who God wants you to be. He's already made you into that image. Be who he wants you to be. Hallelujah. Be who he wants you to be. That is what is, it means to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, which is in Christ. It is compared to the fruit of the flesh. You compare, first of all, you take love. The Counterpart in the flesh is hatred, selfishness, jealousy, resentment. The next fruit is joy. The counterpart of the flesh is sadness, is grief, is depression, is self-pity. Peace, the counterpart in the flesh is worry. Fear, strife, conflict, tension. Do you see a lot of works of the flesh around you? Do you see any of these in your life? Beloved, the fruit of the recreated spirit, patience. The counterpart in the flesh is impatience, hastiness short-tempered. So when you are exhibiting a short temper, just know you are in the flesh. Kindness. The fruit of the flesh is cruelty, harshness, rudeness, heavy-handedness, pushy, goodness. The counterpart in the flesh is evil, wickedness, immoral, stingy, greedy, faithfulness. The fruit of the flesh is carelessness, unreliable, dishonest, disloyal, meekness. The fruit of the flesh will be pride, Dogmatism, judgmental, self-control. The fruit of the flesh will be indiscipline, unruly, messy. Beloved, Jesus, who lives in us, expects us to grow and to mature, to mature in him. Bible says we are being changed from glory to glory. We are being changed. Allow God to work in your life. Humble yourself and let the Spirit of God. Bible says against this, 
there is no law. Beloved, when you walk in the fruit of the Spirit, you are not judged. Even when you are judged, you know that you know that you are exhibiting the character of Christ. As you celebrate Valentine's Day today, take the time to know that the one from whom this for whom this day is celebrated was a martyr for Christ. He died for his faith. He died exhibiting the love of God. That's what it's about. Not the other kinds of love like Eros, because many have reduced Valentine's Day to eros, erotic, romantic love. There's nothing wrong with it in the right context. But beloved, that's not what it's about. It's about the agape, the unconditional love of God. I will end with John 3.16, a scripture we all know. For God so loved the world. Beloved, the emphasis is on that word so. The love is so deep. The love is so wide. The love is so... Jesus loves the whole world. God so loved the world. He gave. Love gives. Love is giving. He gave his only begotten son. He gave the best he had. He gave himself. For John 15 will tell us that greater love has no man than this, but that a man will lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did. He paid the debt he did not owe. He paid the debt you and I owed, for a death sentence was upon us. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Will you embrace that gift? Will you surrender your life to him? Beloved, life is short. People are dying all around us. Do not make the mistake of thinking that when you die, someone can pray you into heaven. It doesn't happen. You make the decision on this side of life. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus. Come to him. Give him your life today. I did that in 1981. I was a religious person. I had been baptized in the church. I was confirmed a Presbyterian. I was raised by religious parents. We went to church. And beloved, as I grew older, I lived my life the way I wanted to doing many things that were against the word of God. Until in 1981, June 1981, I know exactly when I opened up my heart and gave him my life, I acknowledged my sin and I invited him into my life. My life has never been the same. He came and changed me from within. Beloved, you don't need to change. Drop. Come just as you are. And give him your life truly. And he will change your life. And make you ready for heaven. Beloved, I don't think I'm ready to die. But if I should die, I know where I'm headed. Not because of my good works. Because all our righteousness are like filthy bad but because he gave me his life. He died a substitutionary death. Will you give him your life today and make this Valentine's Day meaningful? Shall we pray? If you want to give your life to Jesus, say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I've heard your word. You said today is the day of salvation. 
If I hear your word, I should not harden my heart. And so I open up my heart and I say, Lord, forgive me my sins. Lord, come into my heart. Take control of my life. Today, I invite you to be my Savior and to be my Lord. I thank you for hearing me. Beloved, may you know and encounter the true love of God wherever you are. Let this day have meaning in your life. God loves you. He loves you totally and absolutely. Amen. Well, bless the Lord. Last week's Sunday, we should have had communion. The first Sunday of the month. But we're going to have communion today. And so I'm going to read for us the scripture. Get your emblems ready. As we have communion together wherever you are. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter number chapter 11, verse number 23, downwards. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat the bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and let him so eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Amen. And so we take the emblems. This is his body broken for us. Take it. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the precious Holy Spirit. Amen. The Bible says he took the cup and blessed it. He said, this is the blood in my new covenant. For as often as you drink this, you do remember the Lord's death until he comes. And so we are celebrating the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Bible says this wisdom is made known to the principalities, the wisdom of God. Take, let's drink. For in drinking, we are making a proclamation. We are one with the Lord, one spirit with the Lord. We are one in the faith. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Lord, I declare, bind us together with cords of love that cannot be broken. I declare in the name of the Father, activating your covenant, even the covenant of the blood, of Jesus, the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than the blood of Abel, the blood that speaks mercy. May your mercy abound 
in the lives of your people. May grace abound in the lives of your people. And by this communion, I speak healing, that the sick be healed in the name of Jesus, that whoever has partaken of this communion in a worthy manner, may they know wholeness in their bodies, from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. Holy Father, we pray, declaring your word, that no evil will come nigh our dwelling, no plague. And so may we escape this pandemic. May we escape even through the medium of the blood of Jesus. We declare ourselves covered, our families covered, our loved ones covered by the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Father, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. As many as have partaken of the communion. Amen. Hello, people of God. It's time for our tithes and our offerings and the various ways that you can be able to give will be listed up on your screens.
the Lord. Well, we have come to the end of our service. I want to declare the benediction and so let us pray. Beloved, I declare the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance and give you peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you, both now and forevermore. Amen. And so we meet again next week by the grace of God. Keep loving me. Draw closer. Draw closer. Bear more fruit. Bear much fruit. Abide in him. You will ask whatever you will and it shall be done unto you. Amen. God bless you.